Um, good morning, everybody. So, um, we've heard about the new fantastic drugs. There's only one problem with them. They are costly. And uh, this is a figure that shows what's happened in Norway. For the last five, ten years, the cost of drugs in Norway has been very stable. But for the last two, three years, the cost of drugs have increased with about 10% every year. And we think this will continue for at least 10 more years. So in the, about 10 years, the cost of drugs in Norway will have been doubled. And what can we do about that? What we can see is that the biologicals are becoming more and more important as drugs. And uh, when we have the biologicals, we see that even if the patent expires, the price often is very high. But with the small molecular drugs, like the ordinary penicillin, etc., when the patent expires, the price falls sharply. So, what can we do to reduce the price on biological drugs? And because of the high price of the biological drugs, we see that in many parts of Europe, people don't get treatment. If you look at biological treatments of rheumatic diseases, there are only eight countries in Europe where there is a full access. It, among them is Norway, but it's only Germany and a few countries. And that is the problem. For me as a physician, it's very problematic that I'm not able to give the treatment to all my patients. And that is, unfortunately, the situation in large parts of Europe. So, we had the biosimilars in Europe for now 10 years. And I've been following this discussion because I've been working with generics and biosimilars for almost 20 years. And I've been following the discussion. 10 years ago, physicians were very skeptical about biosimilars, but they are now much, much more positive. And I will show you that they are now using them to a great, much greater extent. Uh, because we, they realize that more patients can have treatments, and I will show you what's happened in Norway. But, you know, the originate industry has caused some problems. So physicians in Norway, other countries in Europe are still influenced by these words that have been flowing around, like uh, problems, challenges, uncertainties, dangers of switching, etc., etc., etc. And 10 years ago, also the patient organizations were much more skeptical. But they are now very much less skeptical in Norway, Sweden, Denmark, everywhere in Western Europe. Because what they see is that more patients have treatment. And that is what is important for the patient organizations. So, during these 10 years I've been working with the biosimilars, I've done a lot of what I call myth busting. And you've probably seen the American program about the myth busters there. Um, so, um, it's been said that the biosimilars are not copies of the reference product, but it's something different. But they are, in fact, a copy versions, and i come back to that. And the biosimilars are not generics, but they are, in principle, the generic uh, counterpart of uh, you know, the biosimilars. So, interestingly, this is what the experts say, and this is a people who have been working at the EMA, the European Medicines Agency, with uh, biosimilars. They say that the similar biological medicine product is a, is a copy version of an approved original. That's very important. It's a copy version with all the same effects, the same safety, same everything. And in principle, that is very interesting because biosimilars are the biologic medicines equivalent of the genetic. This is the opinion of the experts. And another myth busting is very, very important that it's been said that the originator is the gold standard. But, as we all know, there are no gold standards in biologicals. Every biological drug varies from batch to batch, production site to production sites. There's variation all the time. And this is a very interesting slide. You can see that this is one version of etanacept on the European market, and this is another version after the production site was changed. These two drugs, are not similar. They are, in fact, biosimilars, more or less. So, all biologicals 
are in fact biosimilars. A very important point to make. And the third best thing I will do is that uh, it is very difficult and expensive to make, make biological drugs. Well, that's not true anymore because the methods are, are very standard and in Norway it's been, always till, uh, been said that uh, biosimilars must be second rate because the, of the lower price. We know that the methods for making biological drugs are relatively standard and that the production costs are falling considerably. Some people say that the cost has fallen by 50 to 60 to 70 percent during the last few years. So um, the developing, development cost is also declining. And one of the most interesting aspects is will we in the future of the biosimilars see biosimilars approved without clinical trials? Because it's the clinical trials that is expensive. With the physiochemical characterization of these drugs, it is probably, I say probably, possible to approve them without clinical trials in the future. So, um, what about the experience in Europe? Um, after 10 years, there's been no problems have been discovered. Hundreds of thousands of patients have been treated with biosimilars in Western Europe, and the European way of doing this ensures the safety and efficacy of both the originator and the biosimilar. And interestingly, in the future, most biosimilars will have a double approval, both in, the, in Europe and in the US. And of course, what would be very nice is that we could have universal approval of biosimilars. So they could also be improved in Russia at the same time. I mean, it's, uh, it's not necessary for every health authority in the world to examine the same drug again and again. First Europe, then US, then Health Canada, then Australia, then Japan, then Russia. That's unnecessary. So let's hope we will see some improvement there. What do we have of uh, biosimilars in Europe? This is the current list. We have about 19 drugs approved and uh, applications that are in at the EMA is now a tanacept, insulin, and oxaparin, and interestingly, the first oncology drug biosimilar in Western Europe. But I understand that here in Russia, you already have bevacizumab as a biosimilar. So you're in front of us. You're in front of us. So, um, the, and all the oncologists in Norway, they ask me, when will we have this biosimilar? Because we don't have money to pay for the drugs anymore. Our budgets are running low. So, I mean, everybody is waiting for this. In the US, uh, they are 10 years behind Europe. Um, there are only two drugs approved, that's filgrostim and infliximab. But uh, they don't publish application, but we know that atenacept, pegifilgrostim, and adalimumab is in with the FDA. Okay, let's say, see what happened in Norway with the biosimilars. First, we had the EPO 18s They gave a 30% discount. But, and that is interesting, in Norway we have something that's called general reimbursement. That means that every doctor can prescribe it. The patient goes to the pharmacy. He pays nothing. The government takes the whole bill. So there were absolutely no incentive to switch treatment. So what we did from 2016, we transferred payment for apoitins, filgrostim, growth hormone, from general reimbursement to hospital payment. So now the bill for these drugs will land on the desk of the heads of the medical departments. So they will see how much it costs. And I think this will change everything. Let's uh, look at what's happened with uh, biosimilar infliximab. Um, in Norway, things are very simple. We are a small country, five million people. We have one national tender. Every year there's a tender and the companies offer their drugs for a price, and the winner more or less takes all. In 2014, we had the first tender with uh, infliximab. The discount was 39%. Next year, I can see to the right in this table, the discount increased to 69%. But then the company that sold it to 69% took over the whole market, I will show you that. But the next year, they tried to increase the price they wanted to capitalize on taking over the market. 
but then they had competition. Pfizer got in and reduced the price. So they were. So uh, uh, Remsimo is out, and now Inflector is in with a discount of 61%. So what happened? You can see this is from the first month that the biosimilar was uh, sold in Norway. It uh, had a market share that increased a little from the 39% first tender. But you can see when we had the second tender with the 69% uh, discount, the market share increased. And now the biosimilar in Norway has a market share of 93.6%. So the generator was wiped out. So um, interestingly, Norway is a small country. We have four health regions, four directors, and the medical directors that didn't react to the 39% discount in 2014, but that reacted to the discount in 2015 and said, no, we have to switch. No, we have to switch. And every patient was switched. So what did this mean for treatment in Norway? With the first tender, we sold about 7,000 vials a month in Norway. After the second tender last year, the sales of infliximab have increased with about 60%. So we are now getting 60% more treatment of these patients in Norway as compared to previously. 60%, that's a lot. We are now looking into what's happened. Are there more patients, higher doses? Maybe the most important thing for the patient, earlier treatment. At the start, you don't have to use methotrexate, et cetera, et cetera. First, just go directly on the biological treatments. So the patient organizations were very satisfied about this. And the TNF inhibitors have, the cost of the TNF inhibitors have increased every year. 2015 was the first year the price went down. So we had money to spare for the new oncology drugs, which is a real problem in Norway and probably in many other countries. But there are differences. Look at this. These are the four Scandinavian countries. Norway, Finland, Sweden, and Denmark. You see, the uptake and, and the discount in these four countries is about the same, about 70%, between 60 and 70%. In Norway, market share 93%, Finland 88%, Denmark, world record of 97.8%, and, and Sweden only 36%. And what happened? Why is it so? Why don't the Swedes want to save money? We have been looking into this. And this is very important if you want to sell biosimilars, if you want to use biosimilars. In Denmark, physicians, very important. The leading physicians in Denmark advised switching. Switch the patients to the new treatment. Very, very important. They have strong financial incentives if the hospitals use drugs with lower price, they keep the money in the hospital. And this was a strong management involvement. The management also, with the physician, said, okay, we have to switch. In Norway, we have switching at the discretion of the physician or hospitals, but we have very, very strong financial incentives. If you use a lower cost drug, the hospital will keep the money they, they can save. In Sweden, physicians didn't recommend switching. They had the same strong financial incentives, and the management was not interested. So, very low sw switching, low uh, use of low-cost drugs, and a lot of waste of money. And I think that we will all have to recognize that we can't do that in the future. If you look at other European countries, the uptake of infliximab, it varies from about 11% after one year in France up to 27 percent in Germany. So um, it is, uh, Denmark is on the top, uh, Norway is second best, Europe average is about 25 percent. But now we had the second of uh, what we call the big fishes. The big fishes of the biologicals today is infliximab, etanacept, uh, adalimumab, and rituximab. So now we had the biosimilar of etanacept. Interestingly, when the biosimilar Benepali is on the European market, the originator, Pfizer, gave a 41% discount. And that is the first time 
and very important. That is the first time the originator really competes in Europe. Because they said, okay, we'll keep our patient. We don't want to reduce the price, but no, they're really competing. But they were beaten by Benepali, who gave a 47% discount. And now comes the interesting part. Look at this. After just three months, three months of sale of the biosimilar in Norway, it's the market leader. It's the market leader. Because Norwegian doctors got used to using biosimilars by infliximab, so they have no concerns anymore. Look at this. This is the uptake of uh, uh, bisimilar etanacept compared to infliximab. It took two years to reach a market share of 90% with infliximab. After only three months, it's almost 55% with a new bisimilar. So this is physician acceptance of these drugs. And for little Norway, we will save about six 100 million Norwegian kroner this year. This is, this is about, uh, this is about uh, 6,000 rubles, uh, 6,000 million rubles, something like that, on this. So, that, so we will now be able to afford some of the new oncology drugs. And interestingly, again, beaten by the Danes. After two months, two months of sale, the market share of the biosimilar in Denmark is 73%. And what did they do in Denmark? That's very important. Well, the hospital directors and the leading physician, the leading expert, they sat down and said, what do we do? And they gave a clear message. Every patient that starts with etanacept should use the biosimilar, and we want 80% of the patients switched within six months. And they are going to beat that, you can see. They will have probably almost 100% within six months. So, the alliance between hospital directors and physicians is very, very important. And the, the Danes, they are very pragmatic people. This is a very interesting slide. Uh, this is the market shares of growth hormone in Denmark. The, you know that Novo Nordic, they had a whole market in Denmark because, because it's their home turf, so to say. Uh, but in the 2000 and um, 11, there was a uh, tender, and Sandoz, with its bisimilar um, growth hormone, won the tender with a 30% discount. And again, very important, the leading endocrinologists in Denmark said, we have to switch to save this money. So they switched um, almost 50% of the patients within two years. But then, Novo Nordic hit back and won the next tender. So what happened? They switched back again the switch from the bisimilar back to the originator. But next tender, Sandoz hits again, and they switch back. But the interesting, because of this competition between the originator and the bisimilar, the discount on growth hormone in Denmark is at present 83%. Growth hormone has become a cheap drug in Denmark because of this. One of the very interesting aspects has been um, about switching. Switching from the originator to the bisimilar or, or vice versa. EMA was the pioneer on it, but when it comes, came to switching, they were a little lukewarm. So, uh, but, um, so they, they made a document in 2005 that uh, impeded switching to a some extent. Switching is now allowed in France. Dutch agency uh, reverses its position, says switching is okay. Finnish agency recommends physician direct switching. Australian body recommends pharmacy switching, etc. So, I mean, we have so long experience with these drugs now that everything is changing. And uh, the, the Finnish agency, it's not far to, to Finland from here, they say that for, for the time being, as I say, there is no evidence for adverse effects due to the switch from a reference product to a bisimilar. It's a very clear statement from the Finnish agency. So, when we have the bisimilars, it's of course some of the, uh, the switching, some treatment, you are very dependent on switching. With the TNF illness, long-term treatment, if you don't switch, you will have no patients. Interestingly, as we are now an oncology forum, in oncology, 
It's mostly short-term treatment. So switching is not necessary for most patients. But with the PD-1 inhibitors, as I may be, where that will also be something else. That will maybe be long-term treatment because we are making going from cancer being an acute disease to a chronic disease. It's a very interesting aspect. But um, so with oncology, there is at least a lower dependence on switching. And what will happen? This is very important. What will happen? You start with the originator. The originator has a price. You have the bisimer, comes at a lower price. What does the originator do? In no way, the originator didn't yet reduce the price. And what happened? They were out of the market. Second time, the originator reduced the price, but the bisimer reduced the price even more. That's what we call competition. And interestingly, when you then have a buyer better, will the buyer better be able to maintain a high price or will they have to reduce the price to compete? Do we see that a new drug can have a price that's five, maybe 10 times higher than a biosimilar? Probably not, probably not. So why do we need the biosimilars? They're more affordable, more treatment for more patients for less money. And importantly, makes room for new and expensive drugs. And I believe that the biosimilars will have a chilling effect on the prices of some new drugs. And that's very important. Competition reduces prices. And I can see this slide from Norway. It illustrates this principle. If you go back to 2010, the yearly costs of all TNF inhibitors in Norway was more than 100,000 Norwegian kroner, which is about 800,000 rubles. Uh, today, the price of all these drugs have been reduced considerably. There's only two drugs that maintains a high price, but when we have uh, bisimilar to adalimumab in 2018, my guess is that the price of adalimumab will fall down to this level. And then we have saved a lot of money. I mean a real lot of money that can be used for the new drugs. And I think that is why the bisimers are so very important. And um, as I already told you, we have had experience with bisimers uh, in Western Europe, in the EU, for 10 years. There have been no problems and we know starting to see the full effect of the bisimers. So what are the important lessons learned? Well, to have the physicians on board, so to say, uh, the discounts have to be substantial. And what's been shown in Europe is that uh, with discounts in the range of more than 40%, uh, you have switching, because switching is usually economically motivated. And even if I'm a, self, a physician, I say that you can't leave this to the single physician. This has to be a cooperation between government, hospital management, the single physician, and the payer. So you can't leave it to anybody. You have to cooperate to have the successes that we have seen in Norway. So then I will conclude. What are the elements for biosimilar success? It's competitive prices, obviously. Incentives for switching. Physicians, the hospital, will have to have something back for doing this work. Um, I think that the government and management will have to involve, have a more stronger involvement. And uh, uh, what we can see from Norway and Denmark and everywhere, when the physicians have clinical experience with the biosimilars, they become confident in these drugs and use them with no problems. As we can see what is now happening with the biosimilar tanacept in Norway. It's accepted all over. In some hospitals, they switch 90% of the patients within one month to save the money. And um, when we are discussing all the new drugs, phenomenal drugs, the PD-1 inhibitors, etc., real breakthrough, I always say that don't forget the old drugs. Generics and biosimilars, they are low-hanging fruits. We can save money. That helps the patients. Um, improved uptake is essential to save money and give better treatment. Thank you.
Thank you very much. It's a very important topic. Вопросы? Вера Андреевна. Questions? If there are no questions, thank you very much. A moment, please. Dear reporter, much thanks for your report. Since I am, I am from a country which, which I am from Kazakhstan. For us, financial issues are quite are quite important. As you see, this by similars are able. You you tell that be similars are quite able to spare money. Uh, have have you performed any have you performed any comparisons between old and new drug which are original and biosimilar and by and by a cost analysis if it was performed or not кто <laughs> там Не слышно было почему. Это нет, да? Of the drugs, uh, when you are talking about biosimilars, how you prove in your country that they have the same effect as the original ones? Well, they are doing comparative clinical studies. That's the basis at present for the approval of biosimilar drugs in Europe. So all of these have been through phase, what you could call phase three studies comparative studies when clinical efficacy is compared in patients with uh, the relevant diseases. And the second question is related basically to the first one. If you assume that efficacy may not be truly identical, whether, uh, is there some cost efficiency analysis? Well, um, I mean, the, the European, uh, the drugs that have been approved in Western Europe are approved on the basis that they have the same clinical efficacy as the originate. That's the basis of all approvals. How, lo how long I used these biosimilar drugs? Three months, six months, five years. What do you mean when you tell about the durable treatment? specific uh, uh, um, definition of that. Mainly it's the difference between what you give as a single course and where you have long-term treatment with a disease that is chronic. For instance, um, let's say filgrostim is a typical example of a short-term treatment. You use it in the connection with uh, treatment or with uh, cytostatics, etc., etc., and then you use it for a short period. But if you have multiple sclerosis, if you have uh, rheumatoid arthritis, it's a chronic disease that will need treatment for a long period. Uh, is it correct? Uh, you mean that uh, you, uh, it's more useful for autoimmune disease uh, and other chronic disease, not for oncology? Uh, uh, if, if I heard you correct, you, you were asking about it's more useful for chronic diseases than for oncology. Was that? Was that a question? I think that uh, what we'll see uh, is that uh, in the future uh, we will have um, biosimilars uh, to all drugs that have a long lifespan. What we see now in oncology is that we are going to have a lot of new drugs, but as some of these drugs will have a very short lifespan because we will have uh, better drugs all the time. So the biosimilars will be copies of what I call everlasting drugs. The drugs that we use, like the TNF inhibitors, we probably use the TNF inhibitors for 10, 15, 20 years more, but some of the oncology drugs we see today 
they will not survive, they will be surpassed by new drugs. So, so it's very difficult uh, to tell how important biosimilars will be in oncology. Thank you. Thank you very much.